What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? Uh, my very good friend, Justin Davis, who's over there. Raise your hand, Justin, for everybody to see. Okay. Don't ever, don't have a conversation with him and, and misspeak because you will know about it. You need to say what you mean and mean what you say because we would have conversations. We get on one another for saying something and we go back and forth. I'm like, we're, we're both word nerds. And so that's what I'm trying to say. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. But here's some examples of some paradoxes. Here's some hilarious ones. Um, the first one is this, pretty ugly. Can't be true. Like, it's got to be one or the other. Here's another one. Alone together. Time out. Not sure that fits. Here's another one. Jumbo shrimp. Right? Or this is one, this is one of my favorite because tight slacks. Right? Tight slacks. I just love the word slacks. I don't know why. Here's the next one. Definite maybe. I'll give you a definite maybe. I'll be there. Really? I don't, I don't even know what that means. Then this one. This one's funny. 12, well, it's funny to me. It may not be funny to you. 12 ounce pound cake. Same difference, right? Like, who, you ever hear? You might even say some of these. I'm, I apologize if you say some of these, but peace force, exact estimate. Here's one headbutt. Not sure which one that is. Uh, <laughs> I know. I'm a youth pastor. I apologize. I had to throw that one there. And then this is my wife's favorite Microsoft Works. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Microsoft does not work. And then lastly, I have a question for you. Answer truthfully in your own mind, okay? Answer truthfully, yes or no. Those are the only two answers you can give. Here's the question. Will the next words you say be no? If you say yes, and it wasn't, and you're false. But if you say no, then you're lying, and you can't. So there's a paradox. You can't answer it. And so there's some humorous paradoxes. But what I want to give to you is that there's actually some serious paradoxes that all of us face in our world where it makes us think this isn't how life should be. This isn't fair. This isn't right. This is upside down living. Here's some paradoxes that people face. A faithful disciple of Jesus Christ is diagnosed with terminal cancer. Christian marriages end in a bitter divorce. Christian parents see their children grow up and walk away from the faith. Hardworking people lose their jobs because it's prejudice, or maybe somebody has a selfish reason, or maybe there's somebody that has a lack of integrity, and because you won't compromise your integrity, they let you go. And we sit back and we say, these are all paradoxes. These things shouldn't be operating this way. And we become frustrated. We can get discouraged. We can get angry, and we can question, God, what are you doing in the world? Why are these paradoxes happening to me in my life? Today's passage, the writer of Ecclesiastes addresses how do we function, how do we handle paradoxes in life. I want you to look with me in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, starting in verse 10. It will be up on the screens for you as well. It says this, whatever exists has already been named, and what man is has been known. No man can contend with one who is stronger than he. The more the words, the less the meaning. And how does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a man in life during the few and meaningless days he passes through like a shadow? Who could tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone? A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. 
Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. Extortion turns a wise man into a fool, and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it's not wise to ask such questions. Wisdom like an inheritance is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves the life of its possessor. And jump down to verse 19. Wisdom makes one wise man more powerful than ten rulers in a city. I want you to bow your head with me this morning. Let's go to our Father in, in prayer. Father God, we come humbly before your throne, Father God, knowing full well that we don't have your understanding, knowing full well that we don't have a grasp of what you're doing in each and every single one of our lives. God, we pray that as we open up your word, Father, that you would speak to us, because God, we know that it's your words that change, that it's your words alone that transform, that it's your words alone that open the eyes of the blind so that they can see you. So Father, we pray this morning as we open up your word, speak to us. Change us, challenge us, mold us into who you would want us to be. It's in your amazing name we pray, amen. And if you, you can see in this passage that there's a lot of backwards living, things that are upside down. It's better to go to a house of mourning where there's a funeral than to go to a house where they're having a feast. And we step back and we say, what, how can these things be? How should I enjoy sorrow better than I do laughter? And the writer challenges us and says, look, your perspective of, you, of living life is different than God's view and what God sees and what God expects from us. And there's these paradoxes, there's these certain situations that happen in our life that can cause us much frustration and grief if we don't understand how to handle them. And here in this passage, there's, there's a misunderstanding in the body of Christ. And the misunderstanding is this, is that people think, when I come to Jesus Christ, then that means that God is going to bless me for the rest of my life, that I will be taken care of, I will be provided for, and I should not have any bad situation happen to me. I shouldn't face sickness, I shouldn't face death, I shouldn't face any troubled times in my life. Now, you know and I know that as a believer, we are not promised a fairy tale life, are we? None of us are promised that once you give your life to Christ, God's gonna magically sprinkle dust and everything is gonna get turned right in your life. That's not what Jesus promises. He tells us in this world you will have trouble. And so there's misunderstandings. People think, I come to Christ, he should make my life better. He should turn everything right. And what happens is when it doesn't happen, when the hard time hits and they said, man, God, I've been living for you the last four months. I'm going to a Bible study. I'm going to a life group. I attend church. I'm telling people about Jesus. And now I lose my job. God, this is your fault. And we turn in anger and blame God and say, this is your doing, God. You allowed this to happen to me. How dare you allow me to suffer? It's a misunderstanding. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, I want to challenge your thinking when it comes to paradoxes in life. I want you to look at this in a fresh, new way. Because we all deal with suffering. We all deal with struggles. We all deal with pain. And we need to learn how to handle it correctly. The first thing I put in your notes is this. I'm going to give you, we're going to look at four areas that the writer of Ecclesiastes says that should be a part of our life. If we want to handle paradoxes, here's the first one. I put it this way, the absurd life. We need to understand that we live within a, in an absurd life. The, one of the definitions for vanity or for what you see over and over again in the book of Ecclesiastes comes from the word, it's meaningless, it's absurd that this is the way life is. And so I call this the absurd life because in order to handle paradoxes, verses 10 through 12 give us very specific things that we need to keep in mind so that we can endure this absurd life that we face. And the first one is this. There's moments where you, you say, God, why did this happen? I've had absurd moments in my life. 
One of the biggest absurd moments I had in my life is that my father passed away unexpectedly. And my first reaction to that absurd moment was, God, if you love me, why did you let this happen? God, if you cared, you would have kept this from happening. God, if you're all powerful, why didn't you heal him in the hospital when I asked you to? And we expect God to do what we want. And when he doesn't, it turned me into anger where I shook my fist at God and said, God, this is your doing. This is your fault. You caused this. And I imagine everybody in here has your own absurd moments where you sat back and said, God, I don't get this. I don't understand. And maybe there's some in here that just like me blame God and say, God, this is your fault. And in doing so, lost a moment of your time and your faith where you walked away. Maybe you've known people that have walked away because we don't know how to handle it. Here's the first thing we need to recognize so that we can handle absurdity the right way. It's this. I said it this way in my notes. Recognize that you cannot change the past or the future, right? We can't change the past or the future. I say, Brad, where do you get that from? In verse 10 of chapter 6, the writer says this, whatever exists has already been named and what you humanity is has been known. When it mentions whatever exists has already been named, this is what the author is saying. Everything that's happened in the past has already, has already been decided. You can't change that past. And then what he says is what, has, what humanity is has been known. The English translation gets a little unclear. But the idea behind it and, and the meaning of it is this, is that what is going to happen to man, what is going to happen to you, what is going to happen to me in the future is already going to be played out. We don't know what it is, and we can't change it. So he says, you have to recognize that you can't change what you did in the past. You can't change the circumstances that happened to you. You can't change the pain that you suffered in the past. And check this, you can't change what will happen to you in the future. So what are we supposed to do? You see, if you're like me, we like to be in control of our lives, right? We like to be in control and to say, I want to be able to know what's going to happen in the near future. We want to have control over this because we feel like we can actually determine things in the, in the future and we try to fix things in the past. And what do we end up doing? Making matters worse. Making a mess of our lives. And we end up d disappointed. We end up stressed. We end up exhausted. I heard somebody say it this way. We end up broke, busted, and disgusted. Right? You ever been there trying to control your life and trying to make sure that something terrible doesn't happen to you in the future? And we try to cross all our, I, our T's and dot all our I's and we end up trying to take God's plan and control it ourselves. And the author's telling you, you can't control the past, so quit worrying about it. You can't control the future, so stop worrying about it. And so what's our proper response? The proper response is to realize that instead of us being in control, that God is in control. Trust that God knows what he's doing. Trust that God has a plan. And yes, even in the midst of your confusion, God is in control. Even in the midst of your struggle, your pain, your suffering, your mi misunderstanding, God is in control. Even when you feel like he's not near you, even if you feel like your prayers hit the ceiling and come back down, God is in control of our lives. We are not. The next point I have in your notes ties so closely to this one. It's this, trust God's sovereignty instead of arguing with his sovereignty. He says it this way in 6.10, the last part of 6.10 in verse 11. It says, no man can contend with one who is stronger in here. The more the words, the less the meaning, and how does that pro profit anyone? We question God's sovereignty when life doesn't turn out the way that we expect it. And where it says that we content, no man can contend with one stronger than he, what we end up doing is our first natural reaction to any moment where we have absurdity happen. We argue with God. And we try to reason with God. We try to say, God, change this. God, you want to make sure you move this out of the way. God, I can't believe you handle it like this. Maybe you should do it like this. And we argue back and forth. There was a, uh, I'll kind of illustrate it like this because when it mentions that no one can contend with someone who's stronger than he, God is way stronger than we are. Would you all agree? God is way stronger. 
and it's futile to try to push him and try to fight him and resist him. When I was a teenager, we, I went to, there was a park near our house, and I would go there and play tackle football without pads. We'd get a whole bunch of us together. Well, there was this one day, there was this one kid that was there on the other team, and while we were playing, I for whatever reason it was, I owned him that day. And it was because I was bigger, I was stronger, I would tackle him, he'd try to block me, I'd push him down. And then what ha started happening is he got frustrated that he wasn't getting his way. And so what he started to do is he got angry, he'd try to come at me and block me and push me down, and then I would just push him down. Then he'd come at me again and I'd push him down and I would tell my teammates like, why, why does he keep doing this? Like, I keep doing the same thing. I feel bad, but I can't let him win, right? Because, you know, I'm trying to move, do what I'm doing. And so this kid kept trying to fight me, or not try to fight, but try to get through me, but I was stronger than him and it was futile for him. And what ended up happening to him was he got angry, frustrated, mad, and then he ended up quitting the game. In the same way, those of us in our faith, when we try to tell God what he needs to do with our life, and we say, God, this isn't right for me. God, this isn't the right timing. This isn't the right, this is not what I'm looking for. What happens is we argue with God, we get tired, we get angry, we get mad, and then we give up. How many people do you know that have stepped outside of church because of a bad circumstance that happened in their life? That they lost faith in God because God didn't do what they wanted him to do. They say, I'm sovereign, not you, God. I know you created me, but I know more than you, God. And that's what we do. We argue. We contend with somebody, and God's just looking at it. Would you quit pushing? Because I'm not moving. Would you just trust me? Would you just trust my sovereignty instead of arguing with my sovereignty? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Keep that in mind. My ways, neither are your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. As, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What does God mean by my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways? What does he mean? He means that he has a better understanding of our circumstances, of our world, of our lives, of our suffering, and it's a greater understanding than we have. We have a limited view and understanding of all the suffering and paradoxes that happen in our life. We are limited. God sees it. God knows it all. He knows how it's going to plan out. And so he's telling you, you don't need to contend with me. I know what I'm doing. I am far greater than you. I created you. And so what is our response? All he asks is that we trust him. Trust that he knows what he's doing in your life. Trust him that he knows what will happen to you in the future. I also want you to understand what he is not saying. The author of Ecclesiastes is not saying that God doesn't care about your circumstances. Because see, that's what we tend to think. We tend to think that when God allows a troubled time to linger, that God no longer cares. God's sitting up there, he's like, ha-ha, drinking coffee and laughing at us, saying, hope, hope you figure this one out. And we think that God quits caring about us. But reality is that God knows your pain. God knows your suffering. Every tear that you cry, every moment you're frustrated and angry, God sees. Well, how do you know that, Brad? How do you know? Because the Bible tells us so. Psalm 34, 15, I want you to catch this today. He says this. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, his eyes are on your life. He's watching. He sees. He knows. And catch this. His ears are attentive to their cry. God does not ignore your pain. He does not ignore your suffering. He does not ignore the fact that this is a troubled time for you. In fact, he's listening. He's watching. He's working. He's moving. He's molding. He's shaping. He's making you into the person he wants you to be. And God does not agree that the suffering in your life is a good thing. He's not saying, oh, that's so good you're suffering. 
He understands that it is a troubled time, that as a result of sin, diseases strike. As a result of sin, people die. As a result of sin, there are people who mishandle money, you lose your job. He understands that there is sin in the world that affects all of us and causes us to suffer. He knows what you're going through. And he tells you, can you just trust me? Trust me. We don't have to figure it out. I know when my dad died, I always sat and asked a question, why? I want to know, God. Okay, I trust you, God, but why did you do that? Here's reality. It's not for me to know. It's for God to know. It's for God to take care of that in our lives. Trust God's sovereignty. Don't argue with it. Here's the next thing I put in your notes. I put it this way. Focus on today. Verse 12 of chapter 6 says this, For who knows what is good for a man in life? During the few and meaningless days he passes through like a shadow. Who can tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone? When we see this part in the last part of the verse where it says, Who can tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone? We might seem to think that this is implying that this is talking about what's going to happen to a person after he dies. But that's not the tension here. That's not the meaning. The meaning behind it is who can tell what is going to happen in your lifetime in the future. I don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow. I have no clue. I can think. I can plan. I can put a little list. But I really have no clue what's going to happen to me tomorrow or the next five years or the next ten years. And there's many people in society that tell you if you want to be successful, you get your five-year plan and your ten-year plan. And you make sure you mark your calendar down. You go through this and you'll have a successful life. God doesn't operate under our five to ten year plan. And no matter how much we plan and no matter how much we put out there, there are things that happen to us that we don't know will happen. And we can't control that. So the author tells us, don't worry about what you're going to do in the future. Don't worry what's going to happen next week. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to focus all your energy and all your time on is focus on today. Focus on living today. Don't worry about what will happen tomorrow. Now, Jesus gives us the same point. He tells us in Matthew 6, 33 and 34, he tells us this. But seek first his kingdom and, he, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about what? Tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so Kelly and I, we learned a good lesson in our life, in our marriage that there's a reason why Jesus in the Lord's Prayer mentions, God, give us each day our daily bread. Notice it doesn't say give us our monthly bread, give us our yearly bread, give us our grocery list. It says give us our daily bread. Uh, <laughs> daily bread, not breed. We don't want dogs. Daily bread, okay? <laughs> give us our daily bread. If I got a dog each day, Kelly would go crazy. But give us today our daily bread. And, 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 and why does he tell us that? Because if we focus on today and we say, okay, God, I'm going to seek you first above all. I'm going to put you first each and every single day. I'm not going to worry what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm going to focus on today. What do we end up doing? We sit at Jesus' feet daily and say, Jesus, I need your strength. Jesus, I need your help. Jesus, I need your wisdom. Jesus, I need your patience. And we are constantly sitting at the throne of grace saying, God, I need you. That's the mindset that God wants from us to say, don't worry about your past, you can't change it. Don't worry about your future, you can't change it. So focus on today. Trust me today. Seek me and all these other things, I'll take care of you for you. You don't have to worry about how to, how to figure that out. I'm taking care of you. Focus on today. In verse 12, the writer asks a question. He says, for who knows what is good for a man in life? In other words, he's saying, since life on earth is short, and that's why he talks about a shadow, where our lives pass like a shadow. One moment's here, the next moment it's gone. So if, if we don't worry about the past, and we don't worry about the future, and we're supposed to worry about today, then how do we live out today? How do we actually operate on a, on a, on a life of wisdom living for today? And in chapter 7, the writer gives the, his answer. He says, if this is what's good for a man, if you want to know what to do each day, then here are the things for us to chase after, for us to pursue. And the first one is this. I wrote it this way in my notes. The good life. The good life. 
Because he goes through and he says, this is good and this is better. This is better than this and this is better than this. So here he's going to give us. Now, I'm going to tell you, as I was studying this, when I looked at the list, I did not say, oh, this is good when I first read through. I looked at this and said, that's terrible. That's terrible. That's terrible. And as I began to study and unpack it, I realized, actually, this is good. But it challenges my selfish and sinful way that I want to view the world. And so there's a lot of these areas that God had to say, hey, Brad, you need to tighten up. This is a challenge for you, Brad. You need, and so I'm going to tell you, these are not easy principles. These are principles, but they are good. They are beneficial. If you say, I'm a Christian and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and I want to grow and I want to have a life of wisdom, here's what he's telling you to do. The first one is this. Your character is more important than your pleasure. I'm going to say that again. Your character is more important than your pleasure. In our world today, it's the opposite, right? Your pleasure is more important than anything else. I just want to go out and have a party. I just want to go out and drink, get drunk, have fun. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not hurting anybody. It's harmless. Yeah, but you're losing your character. You know, I can say all these words like everybody else does. I can, you know, say these, un- these foul words. and no, I'm, just, I'm just fitting in with the rest of my crowd. Yeah, but then you're ruining your, your character. You know, I can mishandle some money. You know, no one's really going to know. Yeah, but you're ruining your character. This is what the verse says. Chapter 7, verse 1. A good name is better than fine perfume. And the day of death better than the day of birth. Here we see it's better to have great character than all the riches in the world. Do you agree? Some of us, we may not agree. We chase after things, we chase after stuff, we chase after money, we can compromise our integrity, we can compromise our values, we can conquer, compromise our standards and give in for the sake of the almighty dollar or the sake of pleasure for going out after it. And Jesus gives a warning, he says, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? And so our natural desire is to chase after pleasure than it is to build character because pleasure is so much more enjoyable than working on your character and being able to deny your sinful nature to be able to deny what you naturally and selfishly want to do and then he closes it off and he says here here's here's what I want you to get he says your your character is more important than your pleasure so make sure you build your character but he goes I want you to think about it this way I'm going to tie in your character with the fact that one day you're going to die Because he says the day of death is better than the day of birth. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't celebrate death days. I celebrate birthdays. Anybody else? And we love celebrating birthdays. We love celebrating the day people are born. But here he says, you know what? It's better to celebrate the day you die is better than the day you're born. We might look back and say, "What, what, what do you mean by that? That doesn't sound right. Here's what he's saying, that you need to face the reality that one day we are going to die. And because we're going to die, our memory is going to be left in the minds of everybody who knew us. And he says, you need to work on your character so that the day you die, you will leave a legacy behind that shows you were a man or woman of character. There's a Bible verse in Proverbs that says this. Proverbs 10.7 says, the memory of the righteous will be a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. So not true. I could say two names and I can evoke emotion in anybody. Adolf Hitler, first emotion, wicked, rot. If I mention somebody like a Mother Teresa, you leave behind a legacy. And the writer of Ecclesiastes says, look, you need to face the reality that you're going to die. Because when you realize that you are going to die, it'll help you work on what matters most in your life. And here in the verse, he says, your character is more important than your pleasure. Don't compromise your testimony. Don't compromise your faith in Jesus Christ for a momentary, temporary moment of pleasure. Build character into your life. The next principle ties in real close behind this, and it's this. Life is short, 
so make it count, is the way I put it. Life is short, so make it count. 7-2 says this way, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man, the living should take it to heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. He's telling us it's better to go to a funeral than to go to a celebration. And most likely this would be a wedding celebration. He says it's better to go to a funeral. We might say, why is it better to go to a funeral? My friend made the statement to me the other day. He said, Brad, he said, we are not ready to live until we are ready to die. And I sat there and I said, wow, that is a powerful truth. We are not ready to live until we are ready to die. When we understand that life is short, that we are not promised tomorrow, we're not promised the next four weeks, it helps us as Christ followers, as disciples of Jesus say, okay, what is most important? I will die one day. And the reality is I don't know when. I can't control it. So what do we do? It helps us focus on living our lives for Jesus Christ. It helps us to remember to make sure that like Ephesians 2.10 says, that we were created for good works, that there is good works that God has created for you to do. He's given your life a purpose, a calling, and a meaning to live for him and to be about serving God's kingdom and serving God. And when you realize that you are going to die one day, you will say, okay, I need to make my life counts. The rest of the world is going to tell you, you don't need to do that. Focus on what makes you happy. Go out, party, go to clubs, do drugs, drink alcohol, have sex wherever you want, whenever you want. Do all these fun things because life is short, so have fun. Well, here's what happens to that kind of a lifestyle. Those people that chased after that life, here's the reality of their life, leads to regret. They accomplish nothing worthwhile in this world. There's an emptiness in their heart. And they end up living, like the writer says, an absurd, meaningless life. But those of us as disciples of Jesus Christ were created for good works. And when you face the reality of death in the face, it helps you prepare to live today for Jesus Christ. There's a poem when I was asked to, uh, to perform a funeral a few years ago. I came across a poem as I was planning it. And it's called... The Dash by Linda Ellis. And it says it this way perfectly. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent alive on the earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way other people feel and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash. Realizing we're gonna die one day helps us focus on what's important. We're not ready to live until we're ready to die. Here's the next thing I put in your notes. This is also a good thing in your notes. Embrace a wise rebuke. And I know you might say, what, rebuke? That's not a pleasant thing, that's not a fun thing. What does he mean? He says this in verse three, sorrow is better than laughter. Because a sad face is good for the heart. It is better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. And here again, the English translation makes it a little unclear. It says sorrow is better than laughter. And we might get the idea that the the idea behind it is, so just any kind of sorrow, that means I have to enjoy that? No, 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 no. The tension, the meaning in this verse is this. For sorrow, the word 
literally means irritation, right? And so the idea is the irritation that comes from the rebuke of somebody else. And so here we have somebody who is corrected for their sinful behavior. And I don't know about you, but I've had moments where I've had to be corrected by my mom, right? Y'all have those moments. And it's like, now, Brad, why did you call grandma a name? You shouldn't call grandma a name. Because I wanted to. She didn't let me do what I wanted, mom. And we get kind of frustrated. And the same way it says here, we get irritated by a rebuke because we get caught. We get busted, right? Somebody finds out that we're doing something that we shouldn't do as a Christian and they come and confront us. It's a rebuke. Sure, it's not pleasant in the moment. But when we sit back and say, wait a minute, what's the, what's, what's the, the outcome if I sit here and accept it? The outcome is you grow spiritually. I had somebody, I had an unbeliever that kind of rebuked me. I was saying a bunch of curse words because I, I became a Christian and I was growing in my walk and I was saying a bunch of curse words and the person looked at me and said, you're going to church, why are you saying those words? And I was like, ow, why did this, that irritates me. Like, why did you have to do that? Now I have to do something about it. Like, just leave me alone. And what happens is that what our natural desire to do is this. We want to run to people who view the same way that we do. And we say, <laughs> Hey, can you believe that he told me I need to stop gossiping about Jennifer? And the person's like, what? Are you for real? He told like, you should be able to do that. We're not gossiping. It's okay to gossip. So it's like, hey, Justin, Jessica Barga, you won't believe it. The person over here is telling me that I'm gossiping. Can you believe that? What? That's crazy. Hey, let's go to Starbucks. I need a lot. I got, let's get a latte. I got to tell you a latte about gossiping, okay? And so you go and you find these people that think the same way you do, and you're like, yeah, you know, drinking, right, drinking's not bad, right? I can get drunk, you know, I'm just having a little fun. Yeah, bro, yeah, drink up. You know, sex before marriage isn't bad, right? Yeah, man, cool, man, do what you want, it's your body, do it. And we go and find people that agree with us so we don't have to listen to a wise rebuke, right? And our natural tendency is to do that instead of listening. But here the writer says, I want to challenge you. When somebody rebukes you for something that you're doing in your life that dishonors God, listen, accept it. Why? Because that person is caring about your walk with Jesus Christ. That person is investing in you telling, this is what's important. We want to see God change you. We want to see God work and move in your life. Accept the rebuke. Don't reject the rebuke. Embrace a wise rebuke so you can progress in your spiritual growth. Here's the third thing. The wise life. The wise life. And I put it this way, the next thing you notice is right after that, it says this, righteousness is more important than money. Righteousness is more important than money. And in verse 7 of chapter 7, he says this, extortion turns a wise man into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. And here the author is addressing wise people who allowed their, their integrity to be tarnished for a dishonest gain. The idea is that these judges were to uphold justice, but instead, because of the lure and the draw of money, they said, you know what, we're going to make sure that we don't do justice because I want this money. I want to get paid. I want this gift from you. So I'm going to compromise my righteousness and justice so that I can get dishonest gain. And what he's talking about here is righteousness is more important than getting dishonest gain. And you might say, well, where do people commit dishonest gain? Well, Christians who embezzle money right? They're using dishonest gain. There are those who steal to get what they want. There are Christians who say, I'm all about getting the money, so they quit serving the body of Christ. They quit hanging out with church members so they can grow, and they say, I'm chasing this almighty dollar, and they're losing their soul in the process. They're sacrificing their growth for money. That's taking a dishonest gain. And all of these things place money as more important than righteousness. And as a result, it says, money, dishonest gain, will corrupt your soul. And so he says, look, when it comes to life, you got to worry about your righteousness, your walk with Christ, instead of chasing after money. Put God first in your life, not chasing money. Put your family, put God family first before you chase after this almighty dollar. Because you look in the world, many marriages have been wrecked, have been ravaged, have been destroyed because people are pursuing stuff I got to work all these hours so that I can get this thing, this truck, this boat, this material thing. And what happens is families are left without a father, left without a mother, left without a husband, is left at home without his wife, and vice versa. Because money takes the prominence and the place of God in their life. And he says, don't get fooled. Put righteousness 
before money. Here's the next thing he says. Patience is the antidote for worries about tomorrow. In verse 8, he says this. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. And patience is better than pride. In this paradox, the author brings up that we get impatient about what's going to happen in the future. And so we sit there and we wrestle. We try to figure it out. And he says, our pride is what steps up and fe- thinks that we can actually control what can happen in the future. I'll give you kind of an example of how this plays out. Uh, when my wife and I were dating, we met at a, at a school, at a Christian school I was teaching, and we were friends for a couple months before we ever had our very first date. And I remember that as I was getting to know her and meeting her, that I had a checklist in my head of standards that I was looking for in a woman. And I was like, this is the kind of, if this woman has these standards, then I will date them and see if this is the woman I want to marry. Well, she passed through my list real quick, and then she, like, added a whole bunch. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, and this, is, this girl's amazing. And I had some friends and family, like, why don't you just ask her out, just ask her out, just ask her out. And like, nah, the time's not ready yet. Well, finally, it was, it was in my bones this day to ask her out. It was like, okay, you got to ask her out. So I pulled out my phone because I was away. I was driving home, and I stopped, and I took my phone out. And I was like, all right, I'm going to text her. I'm going to text her. I'm going to text her. Then I was like, all right. I'm going to put down, okay, hey, would you like to go out to dinner? And right as I was about to hit send, you guys have a, you ever have a debate about yourself? A, date, a debate with yourself? And I'm like, ooh, if I say, ooh, ooh, if she says yes to my text, then I'm going to be Prince Charming. Then I was like, yeah, yeah, she's going to say yes. But then my mind said, no, 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 no. What if she says no? Then you're going to look like a fool. You're going to look like Shrek, right? So I don't want to be Shrek. So I'm like, okay, no, nah, no, nah, nah, I'm not going to send it. So then I like erase the text. But then I'm like, no, no, I just need to ask her out because, you know, she'll say yes, she'll say yes. You've been good friends. Okay. So I start typing it again. And then it's like, oh, no, 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 no. But if she says no, like, what if she comes back and says, I have a boyfriend just now. And I'm going to look foolish. I'm going to look crazy. for you. And so I have this debate. And what happened is I was doing nothing. Nothing was getting accomplished. I was sitting in my car for like 45 minutes doing nothing paralyzed because I'm worried about what she will or would or wouldn't say, knowing that I don't have a control over what she could and couldn't say. She would say whatever it is that she was going to say. So finally, I hit the send button. Bam. I sent the text, and I was like, what did I just do? I can't believe I sent that. (laughs) Then I didn't hear back from her for like 10 minutes. 30 minutes goes by. An hour, I'm still sitting in my car (laughs) going, what does this mean? Like, if she's not answering, is she debating it as well? And she ended up being out at a party, and she she did text me back, and lo and behold, I was Prince Charming. No, just Shrek, but she's still... (laughs) Still Shrek, but she loved Shrek anyways. That's just... So there we have it. So, But here's the point I wanted to make by sharing that story, is that... When we worry and we get frustrated about trying to figure out what to do about the future, it can paralyze us from doing what we need to do in the present. If we worry about what's going to happen in the future and try to control it, it can keep us from doing what God wants us to do in the present. It paralyzes us. And so he says, look, patience is what you need when you're uncertain about your future. Philippians 4, 6 says it this way. Instead of worrying about all the details of your future, this is what you do. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So the next moment you're uncertain about something that's going to happen in the future, take it to God. The next moment you're unsure about how this is going to play out, take it to God. The next moment you're afraid or you're scared or whatever, worried, take it to God. Give your request to God. And trust God to work out the details. When we take every concern about the future to God, we will be patient as we wait for our future to unfold. Here's the next thing I put in your notes. During times of adversity, embrace God's grace instead of your anger. 7, 9 through 10 says this. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. In these cases... Anger is the first reaction we want to have when we, when we endure suffering and a paradox in our life. And when he says that anger resides in the lap of fools, here's what it's literally meaning, is that the angry person takes that situation that they're bitter about and they put it in their arms like a little baby. 
And just like you would a baby, you nurture it. You feed it. You provide for it. And so here's what he's saying. The angry person takes that anger and says, man, this really makes me mad. And you find other people to be mad with you. And what happens is this little baby that you keep nourishing and feeding and wanting to have in your life grows into an angry monster. And you get people that end up bitterly mad in life and bitterly hateful of God because they nursed anger and allowed that anger to sit and allowed it to turn into bitterness. And he said, don't even give that anger a chance to grow. When you're angry, turn to Christ. Paul tells a story that he got a thorn in the flesh. And he said, I prayed three times. I said, God, take the thorn in the flesh away from me. This is what God tells him. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. When you're suffering and you hurt until you can't hurt anymore, turn to God. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you for you. Don't nurse your anger. Turn and say, God, I need your grace. Here's the fourth thing. I titled it this way, the meaningful life. And we'll finish very quickly with this. The first one under that is wisdom protects the soul. He says, above all, wisdom is what's going to keep your life. Wisdom is what's going to protect you. He says, wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, but the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves the life of of its possessor. He says, hey, look, money is an advantage in life. Would you not agree? Money is an advantage. There is a benefit to having money. And he says, just like there's a benefit to having money in life, there's a benefit to having wisdom. But here's the difference between wisdom and money. Wisdom can actually protect your soul. How does it protect your soul? When you make choices that honor and glorify God, it keeps you from making negative choices that damage your soul. Being addicted to pornography damages your soul. Being caught in lust, sex outside of marriage damages your soul. Being addicted damages your soul. Being a bitter person and just not, you know, opening up to your wife or your husband, whoever it is, that can damage your soul. When we lie, when we steal, when we make a a habit of, of lying, all these things damage our soul. And when you seek after God's wisdom and you make choices that honor and glorify God, when you're living for him and doing these things, here's what your soul gets. Your soul gets what the fruit of the spirit, God works it out. He gives you peace. He gives you joy. He gives you self-control. He gives you gentleness, love, patience, goodness, faithfulness, kindness. This is what you get when you live with wisdom. This is why wisdom can protect your soul and keep you from the negative consequences that happen as a result of living for ourselves. So chase wisdom. And here's the second thing he says about wisdom. He says, wisdom is our strength in life. Wisdom is our strength in life. In verse 19, he says, wisdom makes one wise, more, one wise man more powerful than ten rulers in the city. When trouble times come, our natural reaction is to go on the internet, get a self-help book, look on Facebook for our answers. We try to find strength through friends, try to find strength through family members, and all those things can be helpful, but there's only one source of true strength in your life, and that is found in Jesus Christ. Christ. The reality is that to, is to know wisdom is to know Christ. And so if you're looking for strength in your life, it's not in your friends, it's not in TV, it's not in anywhere else but Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the strength alone for you to endure any suffering. There's no easy shortcut way to get strength to live for God other than a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. So if you want to say, I want to have a life full of wisdom, know Jesus. I want a life that honors God, follow Jesus. I want a life that where God, I know that God is with me in any circumstance, then trust Jesus today. I'm going to end with a story because in this story it tells a, a, a true statement about each of us. Because sometimes I feel that in the Christian life we feel that in order for us to be accepted and to be known by God, it all depends on what we do. I got to try harder. I got to go to 52 life groups. I got to come out and serve, you know, every single time the doors are open. And, you know, I got to work on on getting my checklist or reading my Bible and saying all these prayers. And the reality is that we make it up and see that we got to work this this wisdom in our life. Jesus tells a parable of a story of a Pharisee and a tax collector. 
He said, both of them came to the temple to pray, and the Pharisee stands up there, and he's praying to God, and he says, God, I thank you I'm not like these other evil people. God, I thank you I'm not a robber. I thank you I'm not an evildoer. I thank you I'm not even this tax collector, God. God, I thank you I'm not like them. You know, God, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I got. Man, God, how do I look? Says there's another man, the tax collector, that was standing at a distance. Says the tax collector wouldn't even look up to heaven. And it says this man was beating his chest, saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is what Jesus said. I tell you the truth, that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. The man beat his chest. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When absurdities happen in your life, the only proper response is to say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, there's nothing I could do to fix it. God, there's nothing I can do to change it. All I have is to sit at your feet and say, God, have mercy on me. And when you do that, you're saying, it is by grace God's grace alone that I can endure it. It is by God's grace alone that I can get through it. It is by God's grace alone that I can stand up and smile and know that no matter if I'm in good times, God's in control. And when I'm in bad times, God's in control. And we can mimic the words of of Job where he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, church, I've had a lot of absurd moments in my life, and it is not easy to cry out and to sit at Jesus' feet and say, God, I give up control of this situation and give it to you. It's a daily struggle we all deal with. But if you had moments like mine where I've given it all to God and said, God, there's nothing I could do to do anything with this. I've got to give it to you. You've known and you've seen the power of God at work in your life, and you see God come through in your life. And some of you that have sat back and said, I've taken my life in my own hands, I challenge you this morning. Trust God's sovereignty. Fall at his feet. Beg for his mercy. Beg for his grace. Because that's all we can do in our lives. We sang a song where it mentioned that apart from Jesus, we're nothing. You can't live a life of wisdom if you don't fall at the feet of Jesus.